Yes, sir. I'm ready, buddy. It's time, buddy. Why don't you get those guys out here, huh? You, you have the mic. Okay. Well, if we can all get a seat, we're ready to start. Can you hear me? It's okay? All right. It's okay, huh? All right. If we can all get a seat, we're ready to start. Open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews of the second chapter. Hebrews, second chapter. We're going to start with 14, verse 14 and 15. Hebrews, second chapter, starting on first, starting on 14 and 15 is where we left off last Sunday. Now, last Lord's Day, we talked about how we must be or have careful attention on what we have heard, which is the gospel, and uh, lest we drift away. So this was important, it's important for the Hebrews to listen because they were on the verge of going back to their old ways. And the Hebrew author tells them, we have to pay careful attention, as verse one, chapter two tells us, Careful attention on what we heard, what we, what we understood. Earnestly heed to the things that we have heard. He says, otherwise, lest we stray away, lest we um, drift away. And this is something that was very dangerous for the Hebrew people there. Because like I said, they wanted to go back to the old ways, back to the Old Testament. They were being persecuted constantly as being members of the Lord's body. And the Hebrew writer tells him, just hang in there. But let me remind you what you're going back to, which is nothing. And what you have here is everything. You got the glory. You got this promise, this guarantee of going to heaven. And you people are going back. So he says, you got to be very careful of what you heard and listen very carefully. Otherwise, you'll drift away. Just like what he said when he, when, when in, in Chapman verse 3, or verse 2, he says, for, in verse 2 of chapter 2, for if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression, every sin, and disobedience received a just reward, the people in Israel, the Sanhedrin, the whole council, they did not obey the law of Moses. In fact, they blasphemed the law of Moses and they crucified the Savior. So these were the things that was happening at that time. So he goes on to describe them to tell them that Christ is superior to all the angels. He's superior to everything. And in verse 14 and 15, he says this, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he has himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Now, since we are God's children, members of the Lord's body, 
and our human beings with flesh and blood that's running through our bodies, Jesus had to become flesh and blood also. And being born of a human form, this is the only way a human person, just as Jesus, had to die for us so that he could beat the power of death, which is the devil. Now, Satan had the power of death. It means that by tempting Adam and Eve to sin and cause them to fall away. And he was the means of bringing death to the world, death to mankind. And Satan is called a murderer from the beginning. John 8, 44. Now, also the devil, Satan, had the power and he brought to death Job's family, his whole family. And Job 1 and 19. And he entered the heart of Judas Iscariot. He entered the, uh, the heart of Judas Iscariot to also commit suicide after he did what he did. In John 13, 27. Satan and the death of Christ brought Satan to a halt. The sole purpose of Satan was to make sure that all mankind was lost. But because of the blood that Christ shed on the cross, because he, he, he made a terrible blow on the head of, Jesus, of the devil, as the book of Genesis tells us, gave us an opportunity to be in Christ Jesus and go to heaven through his blood. And so this is what Jesus did. He gave himself to die so that we may have that hope. In 1 Corinthians 15 and 55, since the sting of death of sin, Christ provided a remedy for sin, has removed the most dreadful part of, of the fear of death, which is the fear of punishment afterwards. You see, under the old law, there was no hope for mankind before the cross. No hope whatsoever. And when these people only atoned for their sins, they covered their sins with sacrifices. But there was nothing they can do to save their salvation. Nothing. And it took Jesus' blood to go backwards and forwards and save these individuals. We're going to learn more about that in chapters 9 and verse 10. Chapters 10. And so Christ gave everything up from heaven, everything that he had, had to come to earth in the form of being born of a form of a man and die for you and I so that we may have that hope for salvation. And we can kill that fear of death that's always around us. And so Christ's death was the solution to this death. In John 11, 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life, and he that believeth in me shall not die, yet shall he live. And so, what we lost in Adam, we gained in Christ. Dr. Hoffman's words, in one of his commentaries. And so Christ came to deliver not only from sin, but from death. He was a high priest. He was our propitiation, which means that averting the wrath of God by giving a gift, and that gift was Christ Jesus. You see, God was angry. There was no hope for the old ways. No sacrifices were gonna clean somebody for, from sin. They did so much damage that they had to sacrifice to remind themselves that they were sinners. You were the scapegoat. 
how the high priest, the priest, would put his hands on the scapegoat and throw it out into the wilderness. That meant that all the sins of Israel were on top of that goat's head and they would drive it into the wilderness. Ah, I'm clean now, that's good. Just covered their sins, that's all. Covered their sins until the blood of Christ came. So propitiation, prop, uh, pro, uh, propitiation was averting God's wrath by giving us a gift. That's Jesus. He brought us together in union with God through his blood. Let's go to the Father in prayer. Most loving Father, once again, we are so thankful for the many wonderful blessings that thou hast given us. We're thankful that we have the opportunity once again of being here to worship you, to sing songs, to be mindful of you throughout this day, and to continue to Heavenly Father in the words that you have spoken to us, to live by them. We ask that you may bless each and every one of us here this morning. We pray that we may continue to be mindful of you all the days of our life. In Christ's holy name that we pray, amen. And so, 15, as we mentioned, as we were talking about also, Christ came to deliver not only sin from death, but he was also a high priest. priest. And he paid the price. He paid the price for you and I by shedding his blood. In the book of 1 John 4, 18 through 19, uh, we have no fear, as the author tells us, because he loves us in a perfect way. John tells us that God loves a perfect love, that God is a perfect love, and casts out fear. Satan invites us to have fear. Satan allows us, or we allow Satan to penetrate our hearts and thoughts. And many times he is successful and he puts this fear into our lives. So Jesus knew that God, God's love is beyond fear because he tasted death on the cross. You know, fear is a dreadful thing. Nobody wants to die. Nobody, I don't want to die, you don't want to die. But without the love of God, we are fearful. The world is fearful, frightful, and they don't want to talk about death because they're afraid of it. But we have to be ready because we never know when, when it's going to happen. So we have to be ready. It can happen tomorrow if we are in Christ. There's no need to be fearful because we have a guarantee that he gives us to go to heaven. But outside of Christ, now these people wanted to go, they were in Christ, they wanted to go outside of Christ, go back to their old way, separate themselves from God, from Jesus, apostasy tearing themselves away, to what? There was nothing for them. Many people today become members of the Lord's body and they tear themselves away from Christ to where there's no hope unless they repent and come back to Christ Jesus. These people were in danger. So we, not, we need not fear of death because that's been conquered already. Jesus paid the price. Oh, I know. It's dreadful thinking, oh, what if I die? My children, my wife, what's going to happen to my wife? You know, there's many people that young men, members of the church, older people, members of the church have passed away and left their children, but their children are still here and they're members of the church. They're being blessed every day. So we cannot think about those negative things because God is perfect. He's perfect love. And we have to live that way. So in verse 16, 
tells us this. Did I miss 15? I was, I was speaking about 15, wasn't I? Yes, I was speaking about 15. Uh, verse 16. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. That's interesting. He does not give the aid to angels. Why? Angels, when they sin, they have no salvation. Angels are servants of God only. And they do what God commands them to do. In the book of 2 Peter, 2nd verse, or 2nd chapter, verse 4. Someone read that. Book of Peter, 2nd Peter, 2nd chapter, verse 4. All right. Now, angels are created beings. They were sent forth to do service for the sake of mankind. We've talked about before that angels are here in this earth doing service for God for our sake. And so, they are answerable to God for their behavior. In other words, there's no salvation for them. Angels, when they sinned, they lost their proper position and they were thrown into a dungeon with chains, you might say. A place of temporary torment. And this is very important, guys. They sinned and there was no salvation for them. But let's not forget that we can lose our proper place too. If we don't come back and repent, we can lose our proper place. If we remain unfaithful, we lost it. If we remain faithful unto death, then we can receive that crown of life. Someone turn to 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. including us, okay? Paul did his job. His time, of departure, his time of departure was at hand, very near. He was going to meet his maker. The righteous judge was going to promise him, give him a crown of life like he promised for all the things that he did and remain faithful unto death. And Paul, through all his life, People wanted to kill him. He suffered, shipwrecked also. But he kept up the faith. Now that's, that's physical damage. That's, that's physical torture. But when man today says, I don't want to be in the church anymore. I don't want to see you guys anymore. I'm, I'm just going to separate myself and go somewhere else where I can be happy. You're treading dangerous waters. Many people have done that. And so, Christ did not come to this earth to lead the angels into everlasting life. No. He came to the seed of Abraham. And who's the seed of Abraham? We are the seed of Abraham. The seed of Abraham is all who are in the Lord. Turn to Galatians. 
3, 26 through 29. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. All right. We are Abraham's seed and have that guarantee to go to heaven. But you know the Jews... At that time, how they accused Jesus of saying, how can you know Abraham if you're only less, not even 30 years old? And Abraham died a long time ago. And he says, before Abraham was, I am. And they picked up stones and tried to kill Jesus. That's how brutal these Jewish people were. They did not believe Jesus himself in saying those things. So the reason for the expression that a Hebrew writer writing to the Hebrews and these were familiar to them. Abraham was familiar to them. Angels were familiar to them. Jesus was familiar to them. What Jesus did was familiar to them. All of chapters 2 is a strong warning about Dangers of apostasy, danger of tearing away from Christ. We have to be very careful. Because in Hades, as we talked about, Hades is a sphere, just like the earth. But there's two compartments. There's paradise and there's temporary torment. Where would you go? What would your choice be? Paradise, wait for the final judgment and be with the Lord forever, everlasting, or temporary torment to have the last judgment, to be thrown out into the darkness, never to die, always suffering and suffering and suffering. Those are the choices that we have. Ironically, many people take, take the choice of the bottom compartment. And so, the author has used many Old Testament quotations to prove that the promised one is divine, not an angel, and that angels are not the ones who are destined to rule the kingdom of God. And so, God's salvation is meant for mankind and not for angels. Any comments? Yes, Robert. In 1 Peter chapter 1, mm -hmm. verse number 12, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, for them there is angels, spirit beings, mm -hmm. but to us, which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look to into. Look in that's right. Angels were created beings before the foundation of the uh, Yes. We human beings are the only things created by God in his image. In his image. In his Amen. Uh -huh. We are unique in his creation. We are unique in the way he went about making a means of us to be restored mm -hmm. to him. That's right. And angels even want to look into this. Exactly. How is that? Yes. They know if they fall, it's done. Yeah. 
And like I said before, angels had, had to do many things under the command of God. We talked about that. How it was one of the angels who released Peter from jail. Remember that? He opened the gates and he says, go and preach the gospel in the square, in the temple. Go out there and preach the gospel. An angel came to Nicodemus, uh, but uh, uh, Cornelius, in a vision, told him to go find Peter. Because Peter has a few words to tell you about the gospel. So angels were commanded by God to do things. But then there was bad angels, bad behavior. They did certain things that they were not supposed to do. And there was no salvation for them. And they were thrown into dungeons, into that lower compartment that we call Hades temporary torment. Now this is, this is dreadful, guys. If we don't remain faithful to God, it's not going to be in paradise. Okay? Remember the thief on the cross? Now, he was a criminal. He had every... He had no excuse but to be on the cross because he was a criminal. But he told Jesus, when you're in your kingdom, he realized that he was the son of God. When you're in your kingdom, remember me. What did Jesus say? Thou shalt be with me in paradise. And he took him to paradise. Oh, there's so many things that we have to read about and understand what can happen to us. And so, verse 17, therefore for this reason, in all things, he had to, ma he had to be made like his brethren that he might be merciful and faithful, a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for our sins of the people. Christ's sacrifice was enough. It was enough. God no longer rejects man from his fellowship because he has been appeased by the blood of Christ. In the book of Deuteronomy 18, 15, it says, like his brethren, he, Christ, was specifically promised as one who would be like his brethren, like you and I. He met all the qualifications. He was born from a mother, from a virgin birth. He was sinless. He went to death for our sins, according to the scriptures. Nobody else was qualified but Jesus. Nobody else. Everything, everybody in this world was a sinner. Even the high priests, even the people that sacrificed animals, they were all sinners. But Christ was merciful, faithful, He's a high priest. He involves a dual relationship to, to God and to man. He was our propitiation, as we talked about. Means more than just atonement. To atone is, like I said, to cover your sins, as they did then. Jesus took those sins away. Animals, bulls and animals. All kinds of animals, they could not take sins away. You should have seen the, you, you can read all the blood that was shed of all the animals. But nothing could wipe their sins away. It was just covering their sins. It was just a shadow of the things to come. And so, propitiation was averting the wrath of God by an offering of gifts. And that gift was Christ on the cross. Under the law, the high priest on the Day of Atonement, as we talked about before, he first slew the goat, 
of sacrifice and then he took the blood and he put it in the most holy place and he sprinkled it all over the mercy seat to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Imagine that. You had to kill an animal, dip that animal's blood and spray that blood on the temple, even on the tents, even on the people passing by. You know, the scriptures doesn't say that the blood was wiped off clean from the mercy seat. It doesn't say that. But could you imagine how the blood would just multiply, 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 and the smell of sin would be there? Horrible. So Christ had to undergo the death on the cross before his blood was resurrected self could enter upon the right hand of God. He had to go through all this, all this pain, all the whippings, all the beatings, all the nailings on the cross, all the shedding of blood, just so he could have that right seat, right hand of God, where he came from in the beginning, for you and I. He did a big sacrifice. God did a big sacrifice for us by giving his son. That's the only way the wrath of God could be appeased. That's the only way God could avert it. Jesus could avert it, that wrath of God. You know, in the book of, I think it's Deuteronomy, no, Numbers, there's a story there about Moses marrying an Ethiopian woman. I'll come later on that. Aaron and Miriam, which were Moses' brother and sister, they started talking. Why did he marry an Ethiopian woman? Why did he do this? So they were actually adamant about Moses marrying an Ethiopian woman. So God was very angry. And because he got so angry at these two people, he caused Miriam to have lepers for seven days because they were talking bad about one of his prophets. Here's a lesson for us too. You can't talk bad about a member of the Lord's body. You can't say, I hate this person, I don't like this person, I don't care if he's a Christian, I don't like him. You can't do that. Look what happened to Miriam. Of course, God's not going to zap you with lepers, but he's going to count that against you if you don't repent. So Christ had to go, undergo tremendous, tremendous sacrifice for you and I. Man, I tell you, who would want to leave the presence of God? The Hebrew writer was pleading with these people. There's nothing out there. Christ made sure that the blood of Christ is good enough. Not the blood of goats and bulls. They just could not understand. And today people don't understand sometimes. Oh, I don't care what the preacher is saying. I don't care what the Bible school teacher says. I'm getting out of here. People do that without realizing that their souls are in jeopardy. If God did not save the angels, do you think he's going to save us? But we have a way out. Repentance. The angels could not repent because Christ did not come to die for the angels. He came to die for you and I. Any comments?
This scares me, guys. It's scary to know that if you are separated from God, there's no hope unless you repent. But what about the people that don't repent? Let me tell you a story. Book of Luke, the 16th chapter. You all heard about the rich man and Lazarus, right? To make a long story short, chapter 16, verse 19 of the book of Luke, two people were involved, a poor man and a rich man. The rich man didn't even care about the poor man. He was always put at the gate in the front of the, in the gate of the rich man and the rich man and the poor man always hoping that if he could just get by, go underneath his table and eat the crumbs from his, that fall from the table, if he could have that opportunity. But the rich man just did not care for that old poor man. So the poor man died. Listen to what verse 22 says. So it was that the beggar died and was what? Carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. Now this is another command that the angels had. For some strange way, the angels have this command from God to take these individuals, members of the Lord's body, of course, this old man, this poor man, this was before the church was established. He wasn't baptized, but God had compassion for him. Compassion, he had love for him. That's why he saved him. The angels came and picked him up, put him in paradise. Now, what happened to that rich man? Verse 24, listen. Well, let's go to uh, 22. Let's finish 22. The rich man also died and was buried. There's no indication of angels taking him. He was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that, I, that he may dip his finger in water that he may cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. What does that tell us? Two compartments. It's too late for this man to repent. Listen to what Abraham says. Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your goods, things like wise, like you received things, and like Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted and you are in tormented. And besides this, there between there's a great big what? Gulf fixed that those who want to pass from here you cannot, nor can those from here pass to us. Big old gulf separating both compartments. Bottomless pit. It's impossible to cross over. But yet, Lazarus, could rec uh, the rich man could recognize Lazarus. So when we go to paradise, we'll be able to recognize people. And if we end up in torment, we can still recognize people, the good things that they have. And here I'm in torment with no way out. Now I ask you, which one would you want to be? Where would you want to go? Paradise? Then we must live according to God's will. And we must be faithful unto death in spite of everything that might happen to us, in spite of all the circumstances, 
in spite of the troubles that you find in the church all the time, or in the home. People have problems in the house and they say, I'm not gonna go to church anymore. Look at my problems over here. Anything that you do against the will of God is dangerous. And we have to look at that. The Hebrew writer says, why go back? What's back there? Nothing. Jesus paid the price. We gotta go forward. This is what verse 18 says, and this is our last verse. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he's able to aid those who are tempted. Jesus Christ came to this earth, experienced the trials, sorrow and temptation, sufferings that man had to face. This provided the complete qualifications of the position of mediation for Jesus. He became our brother to the saints. Jesus is our high priest. He is touched with the feelings and infirmities when we suffer. The priests weren't touched that way, but God could feel your infirmities. He could feel how, you, how sorrow you were and certain things like that. He knows. He knows how we feel. We go to prayer, he understands. He's so compassionate. I'll tell you how compassionate and loving he is. He gave himself up for you and I. That's what you call grace. Grace is mercy and mercy we don't deserve. But yet he gave us mercy through his death. And people just throw it aside. We have to understand there's only one way to heaven, not many avenues, just one way. There's one way to hell, not very, man, not very many avenues, just one way. And once a person meets, once a person goes to temporary torment, there's nothing he can do. But when we are alive, we can do something. But one year end of life, your life is sealed. You are judged according to what you did. So I beg you to be more careful in what you read and try to live the life that Christ gave us. Be faithful unto death and don't forsake the assembly as some have the habit of doing. Never forsake the assembly because they encourage us and we encourage them. They help us and we help them. We can't do it by ourselves. Next Sunday, Lord willing, we're gonna be on chapters three. It tells us that Christ is superior to Moses. Many people in the past, even today, they put Moses on a pedestal. But Jesus is superior to Moses. Any final comments? Do we understand each other? I wish to see you next Lord's Day. Lord willing, if you're here. Thank you, you've been a good audience.